I'd like to start by acknowledging the, um, well, I'm, I'm usually, I usually rush off into speaking, but I'd like to do something different today and acknowledge my father, my mother. I'll be telling you a bit about my father and why he means so much to me at this time. I'd like to acknowledge my daughter, Alethea. She's two years old. She's somewhere in India at the moment, and we miss her terribly. We were just looking at her pictures a while ago. And I'd just like to acknowledge all the moments that made this possible, that brought us here, that brought you here, and is moving us in sensuous ways to a home, a place we can call home. Home. The word is, is, is brief, but it holds so much power. Let me just tap into our collective intelligence and invite us here. What does home evoke for you? The word, not just the word, but the feeling of home. So, anyone. I'm not just going to point out people. Safety. Safety. Belonging. Belonging. Food. Food. Awesome. <laughs> Good food. Sensa a sensation in this area of, me of, of, of relaxation. A sensation of relaxation. Yes. Softness. A warm, cozy. 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 Warmth. A content. A contentment. Tradition. Safety. Tradition. Safety. Yes, yeah, safety is coming up again. Warm heart. Heart. Love. Hmm. Rest. Rest. Cushion. Mm. Cushion. I like your very strong, yeah. tactile <laughs> sense of things. Food, cushion, bed, pillows. <laughs> Thank you. That's difficult really memories. Memories. Difficult memories. Difficult memories. Different. Different memories. A different thing at home. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Also difficult memories yeah. too, right? Yeah. 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 Friends. Friends. Yes. Gentleness. Gentleness. Growth. Growth. Hmm? Rest. 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 Refuge. Refuge. Bio. Bio. Fire. Fire. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she said bio. bio. I thought <laughs> 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 Safety. 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 Quiet. Quiet. Mm. Yes. What else? Safety. Opportunity for creativity. An opportunity for creativity. Love. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm getting a sense that if I let this go on, this might just become the talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's... Home means so much to us because it's a place of rest, warmth, safety, belonging, pillows, <laughs> food, <laughs> refuge. <laughs> yes. And also because it's far away from trouble. It's, you know, we, we are a species that is quite enamored by destinations. We want to arrive safely. We want to be at home. We want to rest. We want to feel the joy and the beauty of community. We want to rest in each other's arms and know that we belong and we're safe. And, you know, it's probably the reason why we ache so much at this point in time in our lives. At this point in time in the life of the cosmos, when it seems people are suffering every day, when it seems um, we will never be able to bring 300 girls home, the girls that were taken, I'm sure you guys know the story, that were taken from school by Islamic terrorists. When it when people are moving and immigration issues are becoming the topic of the day, people are moving from country to country and government um, agencies and officials are in a bind, not knowing exactly what to do with people moving across borders. When the very notion of education is being challenged, when our sense of the sacred is erupting, it feels like we need a sense of homeliness, 
but yet we ache for home. We're somewhere in the journey and we want to be at home. We want a sense of justice. I want to tell you a story. It's, um, I told it to some of my friends, my newfound friends. Um, it's a story that is recorded in the Bible. Um, the biblical story of Job. Um, how many of you have heard that story? Job. Um, so the story goes like this. The, Job was a man that was described as being upright. Okay? He was an, a man of integrity. One day, God was on his throne, and the devil was roaming about the earth, and he met with God. And God said, what are you doing about? And um, the devil said, I, you know, I'm just here and there looking for who to destroy. <laughs> and God said, hey, come. Have you noticed my servant Job? <coughs> Look at him there. Um, have you noticed how upright he is? How saintly he is? How good a man he is? How good a father he is? And the devil was reported to have said, well, if you take away all the blessings that you've given to him, I'm very sure he will curse you to your face. And God said, you know what, and I, I've, I've really had my tough moments trying to uh, you know, deal with this story, but I think I have some kind of resolution and that's why I'm confident to share it with you. <laughs> <laughs> so God, you know, God, um, God says to him, so let's have a bargain. Take away everything from Job. Take away his wives, take away his cattle, take away his, you know, his sons and daughters, his houses, his estate, and let's see if he still curses me to my face. And so they struck a deal, a cosmic deal, on the life of one puny little human being. And um, it so happened, of course, the devil was quick to do his job. He took away everything. And Job developed sores in his body. Um, his friends departed. They were nowhere to be seen. His wife said, you should curse God instead of just staying there and still supporting him. Now, if you read that passage, you, you, just like you watch a movie, you want some kind of climax, some kind of resolution. You want to understand why this pain for this person. But it never really comes. Job eventually meets with God, and God says, um, so how are you doing? Like you don't know, you brought all this on me. Why did you do this to me? Why would you curse your servant? Is this justice? And he's railing at God, and he's railing at God, and he's crying for a sense of justice. And God answers him in a way that I'll talk about later on. But I found myself in a place of Job, and Forgive me if my voice starts to shake because I'm in a very vulnerable place right now, speaking about my father. Um, 17 years ago, October 19, just a few days ago, actually the day we started to teach here, my father died. He was 48 years old. I was just 15. Um, and I lost my best friend. I don't know how many of you have a relationship with your dad or mom that makes you warm at night. Well, I had that kind of relationship. I played Nintendo with my dad. <laughs> he took us out to places. He was never far away. But I remember coming home from school and coming into the house and I in Africa, when people are grieving and when someone is lost, the community gathers to wail and to cry. Grief is never a private event. And I started to hear, you know, crying upstairs as the bus parked in the garage. And the person who brought us home, I started to query the person. I started to ask a question because my deepest fear was losing my dad. Not that there was any reason to. He was never sick. He was a young, vibrant diplomat. He traveled the world. He spoke great French. He was amazing. And then I asked the person who brought us home, I said, I hope daddy is not dead. And he said, let's go upstairs. I said, I hope daddy is not dead. Let's go upstairs. 
and he took us upstairs and my mom was rolling on the floor, pulling her hair out, just crying. And I, I, no tears came. I just couldn't cry. It was surreal. My, my, I lost my best friend. He was supposed to retire from the foreign service on Thursday. He died on Monday. So it was, I found myself obsessed with the idea of coming home. I was only 15, but I started to read like an addict and to explore my world like an addict. I so desperately wanted to find some kind of final ground where I could stand and nothing would surprise me. Nothing would remove the rug from under my feet and shake me loose and break me apart. I wanted to stand tall. And so I started to be very invested in the idea of coming home. The years ahead became very painful and hard and difficult for us. I would push, um, in Nigeria we call it omalanke. It's some kind of wooden contraption. And I just finished secondary school. I don't know if it's called secondary school here. But, yeah. Um, I just finished secondary school, and I would push those wooden barrels from town to town, delivering items for rental to bring food to our house. I couldn't go to the university for three years because I had to support my family. Money dried up. I, was, I am the only boy in the house. I have three sisters and a widow mom. So it was very difficult. And in between these times, in between these times of, of aching and pain and wounds that will not go silent, I would search. I had a strategy for coming home, you see, and I want to share that with you. I had three main strategies. Not that I planned three main strategies, but eventually turned out to be three main strategies. I told myself that the best way to come home is to find some kind of unshakable ground. Absolute truth, I called it. And I had journals then. I would write down my fantasies. In fact, when I eventually got admission into the university, um, um, the dean of, of, of studies or whatever, I can't remember his name, one professor asked me a question. He, he said, would you like to know everything? And I said, yes. It was really my fantasy. I wanted to know everything there was about everything. I don't know if you've ever been in that romantic philosophical space. I wanted to know the entire world. So I read about Islam and Christianity and Buddhism and Sikhism. And um, I, I, in, you know, I ate everything that Darwin had to wrote about the evolution of species. I just wanted to find some kind of secure place because I'm talking about wounds that not only opened up because of my father's death. I started to see myself as vulnerable because here I am, a young African boy um, whose land is slowly eroding because of the colonial activities of the West. I had no language to call my own. I had no tradition to call my own. I was schooled properly in English. I was told in fact, in school, I was told, um, you're not educated if you speak your language. So I still don't know how to speak my language right now. Um, and not just to speak English, to speak English with the great finesse of a New Yorker. <laughs> to speak English like an Englishman. I remember those days in my class, uh, the teacher would bring out a video recording of a BBC reporter. <laughs> saying hello, and, <laughs> and all of us would be like, hello. <laughs> you know, trying as much as possible to approximate the language and the mannerisms of our masters. It was, coupled with my father's death, it was the most profound sense of homelessness. And so I decided I was going to find my way home. So I started with a Cartesian strategy. And I'll just tell you about the Cartes. Really, the Cartes also was feeling homely or homeless. And 
One day, he decided to doubt everything. I think he was in the 15th century, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he's called the French father of philosophy, modern philosophy. So. And uh, so the Cartes, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing the name properly. Am I? I'm not going to copy you guys. <laughs> In an act of decolonization, <laughs> I'm going to call it Descartes. <laughs> it's good to be wrong. It's got a nice ring to it. Thank you. <laughs> so René Descartes, <laughs> um, said, see, this is how to go about it. If I doubt everything, I should arrive at the certain, the one certain ground that cannot be moved. It's just like the reductionistic paradigm of the West, of, uh, of early Greek civilizations. If we strip the material world into bits, we should arrive at some finite, indivisible part of the world, the atom. And so René Descartes <laughs> took that approach and he you know, he started to doubt everything. And then he came to this beautiful, beautiful summation that, look, if I doubt everything, the one thing I can't doubt is that I'm doubting. And then he said, look, it's the thing that I feel should be the foundation of all thought is that I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum. I come before everything else. I am central to the universe. I think, therefore I am. I founded, I anchored my boat, so to speak, in that Cartesian island. And I really wanted to explore the world from there. But then, I ran into all sorts of ironies. You see, when you speak about absolute truth, the whole notion of difference evaporates. How did I lose my anchoring in that island? I fell in love. I met the embodiment of difference, my wife. <laughs> my wife is um, Iranian, Indian, Nigerian, English. Her great-grandmother is probably whiter than you. <laughs> And her mother is Iranian Indian, and her father is Nigerian. Um, she, it's, it's difficult to even talk about this, but um, meeting her and enjoying the notion that the genius of the universe is is its diversity, not, not the, not some kind of secure ground, but the fact that things bubble up and different things come about. I started to lose my anchoring in that, on that island because I started to enjoy the notion of difference, to enjoy the notion of, of alterity, so to speak, as some philosophers would call it. I started to give myself to exploring diversity. And so I, I moved myself off from that island and I adopted another strategy to come home. I'll call that strategy the language strategy, um, the linguistic path home. So some postmodern philosophers talk about language <coughs> as, um, they, in the academic sense, it's called social constructionism. Basically, our words make up the universe. There's nothing real out there, and I'm sure you guys have heard something like that. There's nothing real around us. It's just our words, basically. The world is made up of language. If we can find the right configuration of words, then everything will be all right. But then, I ran into some trouble again when I anchored myself there. You see, the thing about language is it divorces us from the things that go bump in the night. <laughs> <laughs> the things that you don't expect. The things that hit your face and you could not have anticipated. I moved myself away from that island. <laughs> And I started to give myself to a strategy of activism. 
I'll just call it an activism strategy. So I joined in some way as a professor in the university. I, I joined the movement of those that were clamoring for a new story and you know, pulling down the capitalist hegemonic empires that rule us and clamoring for a decolonization movement against the white supremacist, the supremacist powers that have come to disturb our lands and interrupt our people. And in all of that, I also ran into trouble because if you know anything about conventional activism today, it's that it seems the more we fight, the more assiduously we fight the enemy, the more like the enemy we become. Mm -hmm. And I noticed the examples of people and projects and movements around me. And I spoke about Burning Man in a session recently. Burning Man, founded on the beautiful utopian vision of decommoditization, suddenly becomes the back project of Facebook giants and CEOs and billionaires. And I lost my anchor in there because it seemed the more I interrogated the islands I anchored myself in, the more I ran into trouble. So I missed home every step of the way. And in these times of when it seems capitalism and consumerism is ravaging our lands. I'm sure most of us feel like home is still far away, like we haven't yet arrived. And I just want to speak to that at this moment. The elders in my land say, the fruit of a tree is not the child of a season. The small acts that we do today, those things that we, we put together today in order to resolve the crisis around us, may be seen as insignificant. But I really want to address that. And I, I, I wrote down a few words that I would like to share with you. Something poetic, I hope. And this is... This is basically from um, how, back to the story about Job, how God came into the picture again, and what he actually told Job to consider. He said, and this seems totally irrelevant to anything you would expect. Imagine yourself going to the doctor, and you have a wound, or maybe an ax in your head. <laughs> and and you're, you're, you're asking for some kind of relief, and the doctor is speaking about sons and daughters on BBC. <laughs> yeah, do you guys know that program? Yeah. Sons and daughters? Sons and daughters. <laughs> <laughs> it would be very amazing, surprising, if you don't know it, because we're mixed to watch it. It was the only time. Spencer, some mothers do have them. Yeah, yeah. That, those were the things we watched. Those were the only things on television, anyway, as a child. Well, um, God comes into the picture and he says, have you noticed the flower today? Have you noticed sunrise? Have you noticed, have you noticed how a snake you know, sheds its skin and becomes something else? Have you noticed how a seed becomes a plant and becomes a tree? It seemed totally irrelevant to his questions. I'm asking the question, why am I suffering? And you're telling me all these things. It doesn't make any sense. But I just want to be an advocate for God this night, so to speak, and just expand that concept a bit. So, it's this. Another story is possible, but the persistence of the anthropocentric, anthropocentric gaze, the reprise of language's triumph, is not what excites me. What excites me is what happens when we encounter that which cannot be said, or mapped, or represented in concepts, or reflected upon, or owned. The orgasmic gasp of the inhuman, the space between words. There must be life outside story, beyond overarching concepts, tyrannical sentences, and rude figures of speech. 
beyond justice claims, settled scores, and arrivals. What adventures have stones strewn across lithic landscapes, denuded of their vitality by narrative and voice? What pulsing mysteries are enfolded in the yearning lust of a lightning bolt? What empires and dynasties congeal and dissipate in the curdling crowds of spilt milk? What circa has tree and sky? What is the pollination song of fields? What languages do mountains speak when sun yawns to sleep? How does one consider the Leviathan? The material world matters, not because it fits into a story. The slime trail of a slug is the cosmic arc of justice. And it's, it's, this is basically about our expanding story of crisis. So we are at a time in our lives as a people, as a species, when we are facing, we seem to be at the borderlands of existence and crisis stares us in the face. Now, there is one way to see this. There's an invitation to see this as something is wrong today. The problem is probably modernity or capitalism or the 1% or giant corporations or GMOs or Bill Gates or something. And we want to nip it in the bud. We want to fight the injustice. We want to fight the powers. But I think from the edges, from the fringes, we've been invited to reconfigure our ideas of trouble <coughs> and crisis. And so probably um, my last strategy, and I won't call it a last in terms of finality, but I've just let go of trying to come home in terms of trying to arrive, because I'm now much in touch with the irony of arrivals. <coughs> I met with shamans three years ago. And I came as a researcher, an ethno-psychotherapeutic researcher. I was trying to understand the ways that my own people think of mental disorders and all that. And these shamans sat like elders, invited me to their space. They consulted their gods to see if I was an okay guy. And they gave the go ahead and say, yes, you're an okay guy. So you can ask all your questions. <laughs> and I remember asking one of the shamans that, Look, we're in so much trouble, especially in this country. We don't have bed space for psychiatric patients. We don't know how to address the issue of mental disorders anymore. What do you have to say to that? And the shaman said this, and I'll never forget it, and I keep on repeating it every day, probably in honor of that moment. He said, when you get lost, you find the way in a keener sense. You have to get lost to find your way. And then he said something else. He said, what gets in the way is part of the way. The crisis that we face today is not an exterior alien invasion. It's part of our continuous mattering as a species. It's part of our unfurling as consciousness. It's part of our own DNA an inner protocol as a people. Crisis, the monsters on our way, is what our soul has put ahead of us to make us deeper, to make us much, much richer, wealthier species. And it was a difficult thing to accept because I had my notion of how to solve problems and all that. And here was this man inviting me into a space of darkness, into a space of grief, into a space of shame, telling me that my place of shame is where my treasures lie. And that as a people, as a species, we need to gravitate to the places of grief because that's where our treasures are. We need to move away from the so-called centers of expertise and move to the places where we can all hold each other because home, 
Home is not in the distance. Home is found again and again in the shimmering beauty of an embrace. We will never be able to find home if we continue to think of home as a utopian, in terms of utopian distance. But what we're being invited today as a species is to consider that home is right here, right now, in the trouble that we find ourselves in, in the irony that we try to navigate, in the resolutions that won't come. Basically, what I would like to leave with, leave with you as, is, is this, that we are facing a black hole moment, so to speak, where the old reference points no longer hold true. <coughs> Space needs to be reconfigured. Time need to be, needs to be reconfigured. Resolutions, solutions, coming here and there, this and that, space and time, male and female, it needs to be upended and needs to be fertilized for something new. And what we're being called today to consider, what we're being invited to, is a place where we see that the dark, loamy soil and the shadowy places of our lives is where we're being called to pay attention to. That's where our treasures lie. And that's where we will find a new way of being alive in the world. One of the shamans said to me that when you go to a dark place, do not come out into the light and walk away proud. Turn back into the cave from whence you came and thank the cave for giving birth to you, for beating you up, for kicking you. And the cave would, the cave would acknowledge you by giving you a gift, and that gift is your shadow. It's to remind you that you're never alone. I want to... Um, I want to do something before I leave, and that is to invite you to look at the person that is seated next to you. I hope someone is seated next to you. <laughs> I know it's difficult, like, it's awkward to even hold that gaze, but hold that gaze for a while. <laughs> I think it would be much more appropriate if it's two persons. <laughs> no threesomes. <laughs> Just stare in that eye for a while, and in those eyes for a while. And as I say these words, there are no solutions. There is no final space. There is no there's no distant project, no outside force. It's just the eyes you're looking at at this moment. The cosmic invitation to become all that you are. We are being drawn to a place where words do not matter anymore. Where words cannot matter anymore. And I know we would strive to find some kind of resolution to the crisis we're facing personally and as a species. But the invitation right now is to hold the gaze, hold the porosity of the moment, hold the grayness of the moment, and just be and stay with this moment as ambiguous and awkward as it is. Yeah, it's okay to laugh if you want. The cosmic giggle shows up anytime it wants to. But that's really 
that's really the sacred invitation of this time. We are being invited to the dark, lonely places. We might strive and fight when despair and depression and problems wash over us. But the wild, creative places that we're staring at right now resist resolutions, resist answers. This is not a time for answers. This is a time for bold new questions. And in those eyes that you're staring in right now are the matterings of a universe that is beckoning on you to embrace it. Yeah, you can embrace each other now. <laughs> so, so what's the way home? How do we, how do we, how do we find our way home? How do we, um, how do we address those justice claims that fires us off to do the things we do? How do we become a better species? The golden answer is we don't know. And that's all there is to it. There is nothing more than that. If there were an answer, it wouldn't even be an answer. I feel very strongly that we're being told, we're being ushered into a space where, I like to call it the tip of the tongue experience, where we're fighting for words to say, and that has been evident in the classes we've been having, the sessions. We're struggling for words to say, but they are not coming. It's because the unsayable wants to be heard. We need to consider the Leviathan today. Just say a few things before I jump up. And um, we've been talking about health in the sessions we've been having. Health and sickness, what it means to be ill and what it means to be well. And one of the key moments for me was when I came to the understanding that our notions of what it means to be sick, those notions are themselves sick. And we need to stretch the boundaries just a little bit to see that much more is happening when we feel depression, when we feel despair. And the points, the wounds that are all over our bodies, like the sores on Job's skin, those wounds are the portals through which the cosmos plays mercurial tunes and touches itself and experiments with new ways and new possibilities. So, when, it, when we're ill, we're becoming keener, we're becoming finer. It's just like death. We live in, a, in such a closed configuration that thinks of death as the end of things and grief as a dark alley. And I think we're being called to know how to die well and to grieve well, and to cry freely, and to get generously lost. Because that's the only way we can find our way. So is there any answer to the questions of coming home, or meeting each other anew? No, there is no answer. And I'm sorry if you expected one from me. <laughs> I know the the esoteric dress I'm wearing might give the <laughs> that I have the answers. I'm not about to levitate away from here. We're all one and the same. So, yeah. Where we feel the most shame is where our treasures lie. Mm -hmm. We need to 
we need to tap into an ethics of woundedness that recognizes that we are never not broken. We, are, we spill into everything. We're part of everything, part of an entangled cosmos. I still miss my father today. I, it's been 17 years, but I, I still cry. And, you know, yeah. But I know in some beautiful space that he's all around me. He's, he hasn't disappeared into some oblivious, you know, blackout twilight zone. Neither has he gone to some paradise. His soul is everywhere I, I tread, everywhere I go. And it's the same with all of us. It's, your soul is not the ghost in your machine, in your body. The soul is everything around you. The trees, the birds, the morning, your English tea. <laughs> yeah. I don't think anything wants to be said any longer, so I also wrote some things down to close it. Crisis precedes emergence, not merely in the way of coming before it, but in the sense of embodying it. To meet trouble, to know pain, to encounter chaos, is to enter into an amniotic space, an inexpressible place where boundaries are stretched and walls are reimagined and new configurations are allowed to breathe. Where every dot, like Yule elves at work, is a needle point, frantically restitching an ever unfurling quilt, a blueprint for which is non-existent. Crisis is not an interruption of emergence. It's really how everything comes to be. It's how ages of prehistoric transhumans, or how ages of prehistoric trauma drove transhuman tribes into docile settlements, paving the way for modern us. It's the violent disordering of cells when something intriguing wants to be born. It's the rumbling of gods that bequeaths fire to all things. As such, we will not be born in neat places where our plans have been vindicated, where our algorithms have surfaced unscathed. The future is mangled. When things aren't falling in place, when you can't hold it together, it's probably because there are larger configurations that are yearning to be known. And because grace is at work, awkwardly reimagining new possibilities and patterns, disrupting confidence, tinkering with virtual possibilities, experimenting with the perverse, making her most ravishing works of art with new cuts here and there. For only when things get confusing do things start to come together. Thank you very much.